your address. So let's uh, continue with um, our afternoon session. Um, our, we have two papers to, to, uh, to present. The first paper by uh, Dr. Rebecca Stern, who is a assistant professor in international law at the University of Uppsala. She's also affiliated with the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at the University of Lund. And in the fall semester of 2012, Rebecca Stern was a visiting fellow at the Refugee Law Initiative School of Advanced Studies, University of London. Her research interests include public international law, human rights, refugee and migration law, the borderland between international and national law and politics, and obviously the rights of the child and discrimination. So Rebecca, if you're ready. Lunch. Uh, I've been spending my lunch trying to revise my paper after listening to this morning's presentations, um, <laughs> as you tend to do. So, uh, my apologies if this sounds inconsistent in any way. Um, anyway, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this workshop for inviting me and also for getting for organizing a workshop on this very topical and controversial issue. Um, before beginning my talk, I just want to say something about this is such a complex project, the Earthworm Project. There are so many dimensions and issues to be addressed and also the level of information seems to be something that comes up over and over that we don't, that we don't it's difficult to find out really what the project is about, the main issues, what is actually happening, how many children does it involve. Um, and that is, uh, it's unfortunate that we couldn't have, um, that this approach hasn't been more open and it hasn't been more information accessible. Anyway, I would like to mention that I've been in contact with the Swedish Migration Board, have been sent a number of documents and texts on the project. Um, so, as we've heard in this morning's presentations, the Open Project um, is in, in its different phases, is complex, touches a number of different aspects. I will address the Convention on the Rights of the Child in particular. So the idea for this presentation is to look at her from, from, a, from the perspective of the Montenegro Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, focusing on some of its articles, and that would be um, the general principles <coughs> of the Convention, articles uh, 2, 3, 6, and 12, and also say something briefly about Article 9 and Article 20. For obvious reasons, I won't be able to cover all of the aspects of uh, connected to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, but the aim is to just discuss some aspects of the compatibility of the Earth Project with the Convention. So I will first say something about the different articles, and then to and then relate them uh, to the Earth Project. Projects. Uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is relevant for the Earthworm Project for a number of reasons, including that the best interest principle, which is expressed in Article C1 of the Convention, um, is referred to as a crucial foundation for all the plans and activities uh, of Earthworm, and that safeguarding the best interest of the child considerations is paramount. And that's taken from the Earthworm final report of the first phase of the uh, And concerns, as you know, has been expressed as to what the project and the way it is implemented or would be implemented is actually compatible with the rights and obligations established for states, uh, or the rights and obligations established by the Convention. 
And these concerns are shared not least by a number of child rights organizations, which I'm going to talk more about later on today. Um, so the pillars, as Martin, Robert, as Martin described earlier today, um, very briefly summarized are family tracing, return among accompanied minors, cooperation between urban countries and third countries, both as regards to governments and civil society, and also there's a focus on information in di of different kinds. And just to provide a couple of examples, um, the implementation and practice of the project, of the project objectives, includes uh, that through the tracing, um, establish effective methods for assembling sufficient information for a decision on the possibility of family unification. That's okay. The creation of so-called welcome centers, which is what the reception facilities in school are referred to. Welcome centers sounds much nicer, doesn't it, than, mm -hmm. than reception facilities. And also the creation of reintegration programs for each returned child. And also the dissemination of information in third countries. Um, the reintegration programs, as they have been described to me, could include facilitating access to education or training for the child that's been returned, uh, funding, economic funding, uh, but also for the child, but also financial aid to the family. Uh, aimed at, for example, supporting the family in establishing a small business and thus improve the standard of living, a better a better environment for the child to return to than the ones uh, than the one that they actually left. Um, as Martin commented on this morning, uh, the information aspect includes video clips in which returned children tell their story, presumably about what happened when they were in Europe, but also when they have actually returned to their kind of origin. And I will come back to these uh, video clips a bit later, because I think they're a good example of how the convention is implemented or not implemented in such aspects. Now, um, or actually, we'll just. Um, there are four general principles in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And these principles are identified by the monitoring body of the convention, the CRC committee, as Articles 2, 3, 1, 6, and 12. Article 2 is on non-discrimination. Article 3, 1 is on the best interest of the child. And the phrase is, the best interest of the child is to be a primary consideration in all actions concerning children. And this all actions refers not only to the rights that are referred to specifically in the convention, but all actions in general. So there's a wider scope. Uh, there's Article 6 on the child's right to life and development, and that includes the state's obligation to ensure to the maximum extent possible the survival and development of the child. And development refers to physical development, mental development, psychological development, a lot of aspects uh, of development. On the and then there's Article 2 on the child's right to express his or her views in all matters affecting the child and for those views to be according to weight. And the general principles there to um, permit the interpretation and implementation of all of the articles of the Convention in addition to being at the core of children's rights as such, like dual function, so to speak. Um, and I will get to Article 2 um, in a moment. Now, all of the urban states and also the target of third countries have ratified the Convention on the Child and the Rights of the Child. All countries but two in the world have ratified the Convention and are therefore bound by it. So they are, to fill, they are bound to fulfill the obligations established by the Convention. And additionally, the urban countries are bound by the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, in which the general principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child are integrated, or at least Articles 3 and 12, uh, which you can find in Article 24 of the New Charter on the Rights. Uh, 
the particular situation and vulnerability of unaccompanied and separated children is routinely addressed when it's an issue at all in the country uh, question by the monitoring committee in its concluding observations to the State Department reports that are submitted to the to the as well that are submitted by the convention states. And the situation of unaccompanied and separated children from outside the country of origin has also been subject of the general comments by the CRC committee that uh, which was issued in 2005. And in the initial paragraphs of that general comment, which refers to this particular group of children, um, the committee refers to the fact that the Convention applies to all children, irrespective of status, who are present on the territory, and that the enjoyment of the rights stipulated in the Convention should be available to them all without discrimination, and that is, in fact, the important Article 2. And as you can see, this, this article draws upon articles of non discrimination that we find in other instances. Uh, article 2 does not prohibit that you treat different groups of children, that you treat groups of children differently, but it limits the, these possibilities to where there are, uh, are objective and acceptable grounds for doing so. And Article 2 also aims to prevent different standards being applied to children when, for example, assessing, uh, when, for example, assessing conditions of care and protection, uh, protection needs based on their legal status, either as a citizen or as an irregular migrant or as a failed asylum. So basically you can't apply completely different standards to different to children if you are to implement Article 3. Um, article 3. Um, article 3 one is probably the best known uh, and mo most cited and most referred to phrase in the child rights discourse. The best interest of the child shall be a primary consideration. Uh, a determination of what actually constitutes the best interest of the child Oh, what is the best interest of the child? That must always be the result of an individual assessment, taking into account the child's socio-cultural background, his or her identity, particular vulnerabilities, age, maturity, gender, a number of aspects has to be included in such a determination. Uh, so, uh, it's impossible to identify a general best interest for the child uh, that would apply to children in general. Um, you cannot, for example, say that it's always in the best interest of the child as such to reunite with their parents. Uh, there has to be a proper examination of all the facts and circumstances concerning that particular individual in order for a best interest determination to have made such a decision to be An additional issue uh, that has to be taken into account is who has the authority to decide what's in the best interest of the child, who makes the decision, and from what perspective is that determination or that decision made. Um, so these and similar dimensions of this principle of the best interest of the child is what makes it rather difficult to pinpoint its actual meaning in any general sense of the word. And as a result, the phrase of the best interest of a child, in some contexts, has come to cover or mean well, everything and nothing. Uh, and it is sometimes also used uh, without those referring to it, actually understanding the scope of assessment that needs to be made in order for the best interest to actually have been, or this particular child to actually have been identified. There's no general comment so far on Article 3 by the, uh, by the uh, CRC committee. Uh, there's, however, talk of one being in the pipeline, so to speak, and uh, yeah, there was a talk of one being published in February, but so far uh, none has been 
one has been made available. Uh, in the general comments on unaccompanied or separated children, uh, the committee emphasizes the importance of making an individual assessment uh, when it refers, when it says that in the case of displaced child, principal was respected during all stages of the displacement cycle. Any of these stages, a best interest determination must be documented. And um, in preparation of any decision fundamentally impacting on the unaccompanied or separated child's life. So basically, the best interest determination has to be made at a number of stages um, in a decision making process concerning these children. Um, Article 6 on the rights to life and development is relevant in the context of unaccompanied children as it confers obligations on states as regards the right to survival and development for the child. And that right to life uh, includes the protection from violence and exploitation, which would jeopardize the child's right to life. Um, and the article is also linked to the principle of number four uh, in relation to the right to life. Last but not least, of the general principles, there's article 12 which is often referred to as an article, as the article expressing a right to the, a, a right to participation in decision-making processes. And views, as referred to in the article, can be expressed in other ways than the child actually speaking, or uh, well, speaking, expressing them orally. Uh, children, are, uh, children can express views uh, in other ways, depending on their age, or um, disabilities, or out of fear, or, or illness, or whatever it might be. So there's a number of ways of expressing the views, and all of those have to be, um, all of the, those have to be respected. And as stated in the article, the way accorded to the use of the channel uh, are to be made, the, the way accorded to them has to be made in accordance with the child's age and maturity. And that indicates that an individual assessment has to be made in the case. What it all boils down to is that you have to, you cannot just state that this is the best interest of the child, this is the views of the child. You always have to, and you always have to make an individual assessment. Now, Article 12 is considered as the provision most explicitly referring to the child as an autonomous individual rather than an object of protection. It's one of the more, more controversial articles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and one of those that have been considered most difficult to implement by states. Um, and the difficulties lies in both allowing for children to express their views, but also, which I think has been the most, the most difficult part, is to allow for children's views to have an actual impact on the decision to be made. And it was stated in the general comments on implementation that appearing to listen to children is relatively unchallenging, giving due weight to them requires real change. That's probably a very true statement. Um, and in its general comment on uh, Article 12 in 2009, uh, the Monitoring Committee emphasizes that the rights of the child to be heard and have their views taken into account is essential in asylum and immigration proceedings. The focus is that a number of different situations are referred to as particularly important in relation to the child and the asylum because of one. And, um, in the um, general comment on unaccompanied children, the same thing is stated. It's imperative that such children are provided with relevant information throughout the process. So as you can see, the emphasis on the views of the child and the impact that these views can have is, is important. I should also add, in relation to Article 12, that the right to express one's views or to participate in the decision-making process is a right, not an obligation. 
uh, which means that a child should never be forced to express his or her views or to be um, talked into doing so. And in the case of open, this is a relevance both, I think, in the tracing process, us being interviewed, asking questions about the family, um, as Martin referred to earlier today, and then I think the interview techniques uh, have to involve an element of Article 12, which has to be respected. And also in the report and in the collection of information uh, and the dissemination of information through, for example, the video clip. Um, the relationship between Article 3 and Article 12 uh, is at the core for understanding and implementing the CRC to its full extent. So, and also in the general comment on Article 12, um, the article, Article 3 and Article 12 are referred to as interdependent. And as you can see in the first quote, um, they describe the principle outlined in Article 3.1 as similar to a procedural right that obliges state parties to introduce that into the action process to ensure that the best interests of the child are taken into consideration. So the Articles 3 and Article Article 3 and 12 are interrelated and both have to be implemented and taken into account for either of the objectives to be fulfilled. You cannot have a best interest determination if you don't listen to the child and you can't, and it's in the best interest of the child to be listened to and heard. And it's also emphasized that there's no tension between the two, um, between the two principles in any way, which you could perhaps think, um, depending on how you interpret or how you implement the way in which a child is allowed to express his or her views. As I said, they cannot be forced to do so, but would you be forced would not be the best for the child. Um, I will say something briefly also about Articles 9, and, oh, sorry. Wasn't going to end that fast. There we go. No. Sorry. Oh. Well, I think I might need some help here. There we go. Just stop there. Um, Article 9.1 is on children involuntarily separated from their families and about the state's obligation to ensure that this does, that separation of children and families does not happen except um, when competent authorities subject to judicial review determine in accordance with applicable law and procedures decide that such separation is necessary for the best interest of the child. So yes, the family unity is a core interest, but it's not that one that overrides everything else. And in the general comment on unaccompanied children, the committee refers to Article 9 in the context of family unification and emphasizes that the best interest of determination must be made, taking full account of the views of the child, and that family reunification in the country of origin uh, is not in the best interest of the child, both if there's a risk of abuse or neglect of the child by the parents or legal guardians, and or where there's a reasonable risk that such a return would lead to the violation of fundamental human rights of the child, that is if the principle of non mark would come into play also in the sense. And referring to Lisa's presentation, earlier today uh, on the situation in Afghanistan, um, one or both of these two aspects uh, will definitely be relevant for a number of children that would be present in Afghanistan. Uh, as I just got note about five being having five minutes left, I will skip what I was going to say about like 20 and just turn to the critique. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier about the best interest of the child, um, it's referred to here and there in the in the project plans of Earthen and some of the documents produced by the project. And in the methodology chapter of the Earthen uh, One project plan, it's stated that the decisions, activities, and agreements <coughs> made in the project shall be based on the principles of the rights of the child. So it's there. But the problem is that as Martin also mentioned earlier today, there's no actual analysis of what a best interest um, determination, the specific aspects of a best interest determination in the context of returning children uh, to a country in conflict, such as Afghanistan, could actually mean. Just speak of the best interest of your child, but you don't really talk about how this would be applied in this context. And also, um, the general principle expressed in Article 12 on the child's right to participation is considerably less visible or even absent in the project plans of a um, description of the project. And the, the interdependence between these two articles is not referred to in it to any noticeable extent. And even where the best interest of information is actually described somewhat more in detail. Um, and as I said earlier, you can't have a best interest determination properly, you can't make it properly, conduct it properly if you do not also include the element of the right of the views of the child. And it could be argued that taking the child's views into account is an integrated part of the best interest determination, as it's described, for example, in the 2008 UNHCR guidelines on the best interest determination. But if you look at how the urban project is described, the lack, of the, the lack of references to the views of the child, or the child as an autonomous individual, really, uh, indicates that this is not a major concern of any kind. Um, so in some, the lack of reference to the child as a rights holder rather than an object, as someone who has a right to influence his or her destiny rather than just to be the object of decisions being made is a definite problem in this project. Um, saying a few words about more specific aspects of the project, and I, I will at least try to. Uh, the proposed placement of children in the so called welcome centers uh, or the uh, reception facilities is problematic for a number of, of for a number of reasons. Um, speaking to urban officials or government officials, um, children are only supposed to remain in these facilities for a couple of weeks until family reunification can actually be accomplished. That would mean that the children will be returned will be sent to the centers when the family are organizing their, their journey to the pool. Uh, but it's not clear what happens if the family or the leaf gardens don't appear, if they're delayed. And it's not all it's not actually described anywhere what happens or it's not really described if the family tracing has to be completed before the children are actually returned to Afghanistan, or if there could be somewhere in the middle of that process, which is super problematic. Uh, and as the reference in the article, in article 10 of the returns directive, um, let's see. The question, so the question is for how long the children will be allowed to stay in the centers and if the stay is indefinite. And also if the facilities to which the children are sent can be considered adequate reception facilities. And that would be a question uh, concerning a number of, of aspects security issues, access to education, to healthcare, <coughs> and for how long they will actually remain in these centers. Um, adequate is understood in, urban, in the urban context as adequate to Afghan standards. Um, and the CRC committee in its latest concluding observations on Afghanistan, which were published two years ago in April 2011, expressed major concerns as regards Institutions for children who, for some, for some reason, don't live in a family environment. Um, 
recommending that the state undertakes a number of measures in order to improve these institutions. And in the final report of Earthen 1, ensuring the adequate standard is described as challenging in the Afghan context. So there's an awareness of the problems actually uh, on the ground. And as Lisa described in her presentation, the, the problems are obvious. Um, now, last but not least, that the return of children in general to <coughs> Afghanistan, where the security situation is such problematic, is so problematic, where the human rights situation is serious, can be questioned from a best interest perspective uh, in relation to Article 9. Uh, what is stated in the general comment on unaccompanied and separated children, and from the, from the perspective of more. Um, because the termination of risk, as referred to in Article, um, in Article 9, um, that has to be, has to include investigation through social networks of the security and social economic conditions, precise care arrangements for children, levels of integration, etc., etc. And even though you can argue that following the principle of non reformat a child who is exposed to any risks would not be eligible to return anyway, uh, it is obvious that in the context of the Open Project, um, there are questions as to how the risks existing on the ground are actually evaluated and what weight that are according to them in relation to the interests of the states who actually in Afghanistan. Um, one minute. The video clips, as I've referred to, are questionable from an Article 12 perspective because if they are, um, if they're assessed, if they're addressed in the same context as children being returned and, for example, getting um, financial aid, then you could question the, vol the, the voluntary aspect of actually uh, providing information and how freely have you been allowed to express your views. So, in sum, and as I said in the beginning, there is a number of aspects from the Convention perspective that I could address, but I will not ask you. Uh, there are no follow-ups. The best interest determination process has not really been analyzed from the perspective of these particular children. Um, the whole project is controversial and in its and it's also uh, it's also um, recognized by the Open Project itself that it has that it are aspects of for elements of political controversy. And I think that one of the major things in this project is not the number of children who are sent and to what extent the best interest determination is actually made, it's the signals that the Open Project sends. Uh, from the key aim of the project might not be so much to actually establish structures to return individuals to Afghanistan, but rather to send a message that there's no point in making the journey from Afghanistan or from, uh, from any third country to Europe or to the EU, because we will send you back. We will send children back as well. And the message sent by Europe should it be implemented to any further extent should not be unrest. Thank you very much. Yes. So far, it has, it's not been made available, so it's a thing to refer to. 
Anyway, so it's in the But the, other, the main thing I wanted to say is you talk about best interest determination procedures as if they are happening. The reality of the Bureau is that they're not happening in any other case. And UNHCR are doing this for the last two years, two and a half years, working on technology guidelines for the governments in the European context to uh, actually set up properly constituted best interest determinations which start from a completely neutral position and to look at what is the best interest of the child as I can say. Each case has to be put on an individual basis. I think one of the problems with the urban project is that governments are trying to find a solution to an issue without yet having the guidance that they need. So I, I think it's more important to uh, work towards development of best information procedures across you, not just for African children, all of African children, all of whom need, deserve, and, and should have, and have a right to have the best information. So, yeah, I, I think that that's much more, um, rather than, I agree there are a lot of weaknesses in this project, but ultimately we're focusing on the best of the only one properly Absolutely, but I don't really agree with you that best interest determinations are not made because they're, say, they're said to be made. And they're, they're, they're clearly not. No? No state has yet. They, they call them. Yes, but, so this is a little bit what you refer to. What I would like to emphasize then is that waiting for, for guidelines from the UNHCR and, and UNICEF the convention is from 1989. A number of the, most of the countries have ratified it for a number of years ago, and the best interest of the child is, as, uh, as I said in my presentation, one of the general principles, which means that it should be a part of any decision-making process uh, concerning children in any in any situation. So I think yes, guidelines uh, that are drawn up uh, by UNHCR and, and UNICEF or similar, similar organizations or bodies are of course relevant and interesting, but that does not take away the fact uh, that states have been obliged to do so for a number of years, which also means that when you refer to the best interest of the child as you do in this project and in many other projects such like that, because as I said, the best interest principle is referred to basically anywhere that children's rights are, are discussed. Uh, without always deciding or trying to identify what actually means, um, it has it should it, it has to be there. It has to be analyzed from the perspective of the particular project. So yes, working towards it, but that does not take away the fact that it should be in place and should be implemented already. Oh, for whom the bell tolls.
depressing position of uh, feeling that it would, it would be great to have written this talk after I've been to the next time and disappearing in it because I've learned so much, certainly more than I learned trolling the internet trying to find out information on Earth. Um, the deportation of children, which is pretty much I think what Earthen comes down to, um, is a bit of a tough sell ethically. Um, and this is partly to do with public ambivalence, I think, about deportation generally. As the Canadian academic Antje Elliman has shown, the public's view of the acceptability of deportation tends to change across the public policy life cycle. Considered quite abstractly in parliamentary debates, the public tends to support deportation of refused asylum seekers, but they tend to be a little bit more hesitant um, when they see immigration officers coming or their neighbor, their colleague, or their fellow churchgoer. The closer one looks at its human realities, the more repellent deportation often seems to be. But the deportation here is difficult also because we're talking about children here. And it's hard to square children with the kind of Daily Mail or general tabloid headlines that tend to construct most people's public attitudes to deportee, the uh, benefit cheap, the burgers asylum claimant, or even the kind of criminal. And this tough sell gets even tougher, of course, as we've seen today, once we start talking about sending people back to some of the most dangerous and insecure countries on the face of the earth, effectively what are called fragile states like Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, in this talk, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the ethics issues raised by Irpin, um, and to some extent the deportation of non-citizen children more generally. And in so doing, I want to critically assess 
will go some way to critically assessing at least the ethical adequacy of this project and to raise issues that I think would need to be addressed in uh, any attempt to uh, reform the project, if indeed that is itself possible. Now, I need to start, I think, by saying that ethical critique of this sort uh, faces two kinds of common objections. The first is that moral values or um, ethical beliefs really don't have much influence on what actually goes on in the world. The uh, Australian Prime Minister, Paul Keating, once famously said, back self-interest, son, it wins every time. In other words, if forced to choose between one's principles, beliefs, and people's interests, self-interest is what tends to motivate. And we might think that this is particularly true in the case of governments seeking to win the next election, or bureaucracies who are nominally there just to carry out the wishes of elected politicians. A second reason for uh, resisting a moral perspective is that moral conflicts look like they're irresolvable. It's pointless to talk about values, one might think, because everyone's values are different and unreconcilable. It's better to talk about what the law says, like what, like what Rebecca just did, um, or pitch our arguments again back at self-interest. Now, none of these claims against ethical theorizing are completely absurd, but neither of them are completely accurate. On the subject of self-interest, what I think is interesting about uh, government discussion of migrants and refugees is that even though states often have the power simply to resist the entry of such people, they almost always draw on moral forms of argumentation to justify restrictions and um, exclusions and sometimes admissions. Typically, politicians don't just say that refugees have no right to come, they characterize them as morally deficient or um, undeserving. Huge unknowns, bogus asylum seekers, welfare checks, for example. And they appeal to these characterizations because um, they judge that they will influence the attitudes and the behavior of the citizenries that they claim to represent. In other words, governments themselves, political leaders themselves, see this moral language as causally important in terms of legitimating themselves and their actions towards their citizens, and perhaps to the international public as well. Now, the second claim about the uh, incommensurability or diversity of value is also misleading, though for somewhat more complicated reasons. But they needn't detain us here, because what I propose to do um, in this talk, what I propose to use as my ethical standard for um, assessing urban are the values to which the supporters, at least if one can read this material that they produce, of urban supporters, the values to which they appeal themselves. So I'm going to engage then in a kind of contextual normative critique, one that relies on the values implicit in this platform rather than parachuting in with external and potentially alien uh, values. Now, in order to undertake this task, I want to start by identifying what I see as the major values implicit in the urban project. And in doing so, I'll attempt to defend the project in the most vigorous way that I can. And I'll then to move to, yes, I know that's a hard task after today's event, but I'll then move to interrogate the applicability of these values themselves, asking whether they are indeed compatible with the return of children back to countries like Afghanistan and um, Iraq. And I'll conclude by um, suggesting that urban doesn't take the implications of its core values seriously enough and suggest as well some further, further ethical questions, if I have time, raised by the project. So what's to be said ethically for uh, urban? What are its guiding values? Well, I think they can be stated as such. First, it uh, aims to protect the uh, integrity of um, asylum. Second, it affirms the importance of home. Third, it uh, aims to protect the security of those sent back and those who are on the move. Now, let me outline some of these values then in more depth. 
The first value that uh, Urban claims to uh, promote is the integrity of, and consequently public confidence in, the um, asylum systems in the participating countries. It does this by uh, returning unsuccessful asylum seekers to the countries of um, origin. What's the point of any asylum system, one might well ask, unless it can achieve its end of separating out those who should stay, who uh, warrant protection, from those who should not. If um, asylum systems merely allow people to stay, regardless of their need for uh, protection, as was arguably the case with Germany's asylum system in the uh, early 1990s, the public will lose faith in the system and protection will fall into disrepute. To extend this argument morally, we might say that the return of um, unsuccessful asylum seekers is a morally defensible part of a kind of implicit asylum contract between states and um, asylum applicants. Under this contract, states have a duty to um, employ sound and fair procedures that um, assess a particular individual's need for uh, protection and provide it if it is needed. And in return, individuals have a duty to uh, leave the country if their protection claim is unsuccessful. Thus, one reason to support urban is that if we care about the provision of um, asylum, and we're pretty seriously morally deficient if we do not, uh, we uh, must respect the uh, legitimacy of states enforcing the return home of those whose claims do not warrant protection. Okay, now I've got two glasses of water here, which one is mine? <laughs> The second value um, evidenced in, in uh, Urban, I shall loosely call uh, respect for home. Urban is ethically defensible because it returns people back to where they should be, back to their home. Now, home here, stick with me on this. <laughs> home here is conceptualized in the first instance as one's country of citizenship, valued in part because of the specific cultural and national context that it provides. This feature of deportation, the fact that it returns people to where they uh, belong, is what differentiates deportation from forced migration generally. After all, deportation is perhaps the most coerced form of movement that there is in the world today. If you don't leave under your own steam, you'll actually be carried out of the state. Uh, urban then is morally respectable because it enables children to uh, reconnect with their homeland, including their culture, national history, and their environment in a particular territorial space. An appropriate analogy here might be the way that social workers attempt to place adopted children with parents of a similar ethnic or racial background. Now, the second dimension to this aspect of home, of course, under urban efforts are made to trace and in some cases return accompanied children to sorry unaccompanied children to their parents as well as the state of citizenship. So home could be extensively conceived of as the family relationship as well. So urban then might be defended as a kind of family reunification policy in reverse. Just as states make uh, provision for families to be uh, reunited by um, allowing their uh, immediate relatives to enter a country under immigration schemes, urban unifies families through return or um, expulsion. In both cases, the, the importance of the family bond might be said to be affirmed by state action. Now, the third value embedded, um, embedded in uh, urban is that of security. A prominent feature of all defences of uh, urban is the central role that the security and welfare of children involved is said to occupy by its proponents in the scheme. In the UK government's articulation, at least as presented in uh, response to uh, parliamentary questions, return will um, apply only to unsuccessful asylum seekers, only to those above the age of 16, and then only to those who uh, have been individually screened to uh, ensure it would be safe and secure 
to uh, return to um, Afghanistan, um, albeit um, by a funded uh, welcome centres in uh, Kabul. Now, um, there's also another way in which Durban prioritises the security of children in uh, its care, and that's by um, and that's because by uh, returning unsuccessful asylum seekers, it might be said to uh, deter, or uh, if I could use a slightly awful term, disincentivise uh, long and dangerous trips by children from um, Afghanistan to uh, Europe when they have little chance of actually receiving uh, protection and perhaps little need for it. Um, this is perhaps particularly the case if uh, returns under IRPM are uh, reasonably well publicised, and by what we heard this morning it sounds like they are. A similar logic is at work in the Australian government's current policy of using Nauru as a processing centre for, um, for um, asylum claims. According to Australian officials, the um, aim is at least in part to uh, deter life threatening to its to uh, Australia by sea. So there it is, okay. According to its supporters, IRPM is compatible with the integrity of um, asylum, proper respect for the importance of home and for family, and with the security of children returned and, um, of, um, and the security of um, others who might embark upon life threatening um, or perhaps even or perhaps just dangerous. Uh, voyages to um, Europe. Now, these are not trivial virtues and ones that we shouldn't uh, lightly dismiss, um, I think. Uh, now, it might be said that um, these values are not really the ones which are motivating the states in question here. Really, they're just extending their um, immigration controls for uh, various reasons, to minimise costs, to get rid of unwanted foreigners, or to achieve electoral Ends. But we have to reckon, uh, recognize that motivation may not matter that much here if the ends are in themselves valuable. After all, the fact that the National Party government in South Africa supported the um, end of apartheid because it feared civil war rather than being committed to um, uh, racial equality didn't make abolishing apartheid any less good or right as a policy. So I think a better approach is just to leave the motivations aside, to start with at least, and to take these moral goals that I've talked about at face value. We can then critically question whether urban is really an um, appropriate way of realising them. So let me now return to them with a slightly more critical eye. Firstly, the integrity of um, asylum. Well, I think there's some reasons for doubting uh, its force in the urban case. First, it's not clear to me that public confidence in um, asylum is so lacking in nuance that it mandates the sending back to uh, countries like Afghanistan of children who, are, who themselves have failed to uh, receive um, asylum. After all, uh, the UK policy hitherto has been not to send children back home, and this practice has been relatively uncontroversial as far as I can tell. Certainly it doesn't seem to have damaged public confidence in the institution of um, asylum. Indeed, it seems to me that the case needs to be made to the public for the actual necessity of deporting children rather than against it. I was um, recently taken on a tour with uh, Bridget Anderson of a, a specially designed UK immigration detention centre for families with children called Cedars. Now, it was a very impressive place. Unlike other removal centres, there were lovely child-friendly murals on the walls. There was hotel-like accommodation. Uh, there, there were hidden fences rather than obvious ones. There were huge toy and learning rooms there for children detained there and qualified staff for uh, bananos on hand to supervise and to assist the children. No expense had clearly been spared on this detention centre. The thing was that when we visited it, 
this place, the Cedars, was uh, empty. Well, even at capacity, it could only take a relatively small number of families. And, and it left one wondering why all this effort for such a small number of children. But this, I think, was the wrong question. Uh, the centre was designed in the way it was less to uh, ease the anxieties of the, of the detained children than to reassure the public that the detention of children should, could be acceptable. So the point is this, if we have to go to such elaborate efforts to uh, convince the public that uh, detaining children or deporting them can be done humanely, we can hardly then turn around and um, argue that public confidence in the asylum system depends on deporting groups, uh, such practices. Now a second limitation of the integrity rationale is that the implicit contract that I spoke of between the asylum seeker and the state breaks down with the case of children. Uh, it might be reasonable, it might be reasonable, we can argue it, uh, for the state to um, argue that um, adult protection claimants by uh, lodging their claim have uh, implicitly accepted that they have a duty uh, to uh, return home if they are unsuccessful. But, to, but children are too young to be bound by such compacts, either implicit or, or perhaps explicit. They are incapable of giving informed consent in this kind of way. That's why we have special ethical arrangements that must take place before academics, amongst others, can uh, conduct research with uh, children. And it's thus clear that one important moral reason why the state demands that um, unsuccessful asylum applicants return home or can be forced home cannot be applied in this particular case of children. Finally, there seems to me something morally dubious about arguing for the deportation of children as a means to protecting the integrity of the asylum system. This is because it seems that we are using the welfare and the security of children merely as a means to, uh, to uh, achieve an uh, institutional goal, that of preserving immigration control. Now, I'm no expert on uh, interpreting what the best interests of the child means, though I know a little bit more after Rebecca's talk. But surely on um, any relevant uh, um, on uh, any relatively stringent understanding or uh, reading of this concept, um, the child's welfare should not be made subservient to uh, most other social goals. If we take children as uh, individuals, in Kantian terms, who uh, must be treated as ends rather than simply means, the whole idea of using these integrity arguments seems somewhat dubious. Okay, a more promising line of defence then of the urban is the claim that it respects the um, identities of the children involved by uh, returning them home and, if possible, allowing them to uh, rejoin relatives. But this claim of home is uh, immediately made a little bit dubious by the need to take into account security concerns and um, adequate places to host the children concerned and the difficulties of hooking up with parents. It looks like it's going to be Kabul that will become the home for uh, most of them, regardless of whereabouts in the country they actually come from. But on a deeper level, the problem, um, the value of home, or the value of home embodied in the urban ideal is that it's a very static interpretation of what this concept is. Above all, it takes little account of how these young people's identities have changed during their time in uh, European countries, those European countries within which they've sought protection. It um, ignores the fact that the children may now feel they belong and may have morally good reasons, good grounds to believe that they belong in the European country in which they're now living. 
The idea that those who belong in a liberal state extends beyond the holders of legal citizenship chimes well with um, a range of recent writing by uh, political and legal theorists, including Joseph Karens, Rania Balbuk, and um, Eilat Shachar. From a range of perspectives, all of these scholars have stressed that non-citizens may have powerful moral claims to uh, citizenship and protection in states that they have been living in, especially when they have lived there for uh, many years and have become integrated into these uh, societies. One form of this argument draws upon communitarian views of state membership. And in this view, our individual entities are a product of the social and cultural community in which we live. Hence, people who live in states for a long period, by becoming part of the fabric of that social and cultural community, have strong grounds for claiming membership and being protected from deportation. This societal or moral view of membership has special relevance for young non-citizens. Because even though they may have lived in the state for a relatively short period of time, they often adapt at great speed to the society's dominant norms, values, culture. The malleability of their personality, their, their participation in schools, and their networks of friends tends to telescope the process of social integration turning them quickly, I would argue, into societal members, sometimes in a period of just a couple of years. And here we can remember Lisa's comment uh, earlier this morning that many of those returning were viewed as westernized by those back in Afghanistan. So if, if we are to take seriously children's claims to home, we may be led, at least in some circumstances, to um, accept their uh, moral right to stay in Europe. And there's another aspect of this conception of uh, identity to which Urban appeals, of course, and that is to family, to uh, the fact that children should be with their relatives and, if possible, with their parents. This itself is clearly a powerful moral claim. But it's important to note that sending children to um, Afghanistan is not necessarily the only way of respecting it. We could also reunite families within Europe by uh, offering the parents the uh, opportunity to uh, join their children here. This would be particularly appropriate if security concerns make it dangerous for people to return to their family homes. Right on. Of course, governments seem very unlikely to take this step, but this merely raises the question of how serious they are in their commitment to the value at stake here of reuniting families. Now, this leads us to the last value affirmed by Urban, that of security. The claim that the security and welfare of the returnees can be ensured is obviously a key element in the project's legitimacy. The grave doubts have been expressed here today about whether any person living in um, Afghanistan today can really enjoy a secure life, especially children. Here is a country that by almost any indicator is a failing state and where parts of the country are still experiencing violent conflict. Whatever else we may say about the urban project, one thing is for sure. It it um, involves sending people from uh, countries where, um, where the um, average life expectancy is um, 80 years to uh, one where the average life expectancy is 48.3 years. But let's put aside the question of the security situation within Afghanistan. Let's instead consider the implications of uh, urban for the security of those children within Europe, subject to its provisions. I'm concerned here with uh, security not in the brute physical protection terms, such as access to uh, rights and to a, a non-life 
a non-life-threatening environment. It's clear that Europe is uh, superior to um, Afghanistan in this regard. But in terms of children's overall well-being, their psychological health, their subjective experience of security, here we need to ask what are the implications of um, urbans making children subject to uh, deportation once they reach a certain age, be it 16 or be it 18. Clearly, any unsuccessful asylum seeker child advancing towards that um, age will have to live under the shadow of deportation. If the cutoff is uh, 18, one would expect this to weigh particularly heavily on the mind of a 17-year-old. If it was 16, it would weigh heavily on the mind of a 15-year-old. A supposedly safe age at which we deport someone does not mean that the anxiety, the sense of a life in limbo, begins only when removal is actually being affected. On the contrary, it will colour the individual's experiences for months or perhaps even years before. Indeed, that is what anxiety is. Worry about a future event. So if we're going to take the security of children seriously as a concept, it would pay for us to consider a concept like ontological security rather than simple, brute physical security. And I borrow this term from Elaine Chase, who studied unaccompanied children in the UK. She found that what they most valued in their lives was, and I quote, a biographical narrative, a sense of belonging and attachment, a belief that life had routine, predictability, and could offer security, and a sense of projected self with a clear trajectory. Now, these are hard enough things to um, establish in childhood and youth anyway, but they're next to impossible in a context in which children live under the shadow of possible expulsion from the state. Now, if we adopt this kind of broad view of children's security, if we see it both back at home as well as in, as well as in Afghanistan, if we look at it beyond the physical and look at the social and the mental aspects of it, can, can it really be compatible with the urban project? I don't think so. So let me draw my discussion to, uh, to, um, to a close, but before I do so, let me just say that I've only scratched the surface of the model, um, of the model terrain of urban in this course, and I'm happy to question on to talk about other elements. There are, plenty of, uh, there are plenty of other questions that we might consider, including whether we have special obligations, obligations of a higher order to people from Afghanistan if we are living in countries which have invaded or uh, militarily intervened in those countries. Secondly, how does the moral landscape of um, urban change? Um, if we if the children themselves uh, consent to being returned to their country of um, to their country of um, origin, or perhaps are themselves even eager to uh, return. Finally, we need to ask whether the asylum systems in uh, Europe are procedurally fair, uh, fair, uh, fair enough to make us confident that those children being returned are not themselves refugees. And this last question seems particularly relevant given that last year a study by the Children's Society found that most children in the UK experienced that uh, system as long, traumatic and um, upsetting. And some felt that it was pervaded by this culture of disbelief. So even my scratching of the surface here, however, shows serious problems with the um, urban. The key values that are supposed to inform this project are conceptualized too uh, narrowly or um, uncritically to ground the practice of deportation. A cynic might say that's because the values are simply a fig leaf or the real state aim of getting out of the country uh, 
people that it doesn't want to accept responsibility for. Certainly, however, if we take the values uh, and claims to um, embody seriously, uh, return particularly, particularly to countries like Afghanistan and Iraq seems pretty hard to Do mm. uh, you want me to take them? Okay, Barbara. Um, we just used to bring the Vietnamese families to a lot of other If you want to look at the current ethnic composition of the United States, Canada, and Australia, it was basically determined by family reunification programs, which were an unintended consequence of taking refugees in the first instance. So your point is a completely valid one. It's those people that came afterwards as part of family reunification campaigns that dramatically reshaped those societies. Now, whether that's an argument for or whether that's an argument against, I'll leave up to you. But at the same time, clearly there's a long tradition doing it in those circles. Yes. Lisa. Thanks, Martin. That was really interesting. And what have you made of that poem? I think it's a really big one. And it's an illustration of the case of Afghanistan. Not least because many of the children, many of the Afghan children, who see the side of Europe, have either grown up in Iran or been born in Iran. Okay. And spent most of their lives in Iran. And it's a this notion of returning them Thank you, Lisa. I think that's a very um, strong point. I mean, obviously, country of citizenship is being used as a shorthand or a kind of moral conception of membership in a particular uh, state or a particular community. And that's particularly, I mean, the kind of inadequacy of that can be borne out um, by, I mean, first by thinking about their relationship to these European countries, but also by looking at whether they really have this relationship, any subjective relationship to the country concerned, or whether it's just a kind of legal formality in that context. And I I, um, I haven't thought about this from the Afghanistan end quite as much as you clearly have. And you're absolutely right. I see that point um, very clearly, that um, if they were refugees in those countries, then they may even have any kind of, it, it may be even harder to argue that home is anything other than a legal concept. Yeah. Um, Brad, sorry, I'm, I'm still finding hard to get used to the fact that I'm there. Yes. I was going to say, even, even if they do have sort of some sense of home, they have some sense of home. A number of other moral arguments on the book at which they can find the best practice. For example, well, that was the point I was trying to make in terms of the European side. That if you're going to take home so seriously here, specifically as a kind of moral concept rather than just a legal one then maybe the, the most powerful moral claim is to the countries in which they're currently residing, depending on your conception 
of what a state is as a morally defensible entity. And there are a number of different ways of conceptualizing that. One is a kind of relatively communitarian one that says that the state in which you're morally member of, to a certain extent, is the state that has shaped you as an individual. It's shaped your kind of sense of identity, both in a national community and perhaps more local communities, your sense of values, your sense of norms. And if you take that seriously as a conception, and half the time we want to, because we're all a bit, you know, lots of politicians are very nationalist on these levels, then that kind of uh, makes it even more difficult, I think, to justify the deportation or the sending back of children on the grounds that you're really sending them home in these circumstances. Yes, Rebecca. Yes. Um, I was thinking about the It becomes Europeanized, Sorry, so it would be acceptable in relation to sending them yes. to a Dublin country? No, there are two things. Similar, the similar aspect between the person sending children yeah. to a Dublin country yeah. exactly, have good enough protection facilities in France and the same sort of uh, problems. But Though then they, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So that's one point. And that's the lack of being a comment on that. And the other is, would you think? I have an eight-year-old son and he can still move around um, and you know if I kicked him out of the house he'd probably have to adapt in some respect and might move somewhere around the UK but I still think I'd have trouble seeing that as consensual movement or constructing him as an adult for the purposes of a moral or a quasi-legal um, quasi contract here. That just might be a sign of desperation as much as anything else. I mean, we have certain cutoff points at which we, we decide in society that someone is an adult and can give their informed consent to certain things like medical procedures and things like that. I mean, maybe they, I mean, maybe in some respects they're more complicated given to considerations of pregnancy and things like that. But I mean, we need to explore that in relation to these kinds of decisions. But I don't see how the conditions back in um, Afghanistan, just coming back to your first question, get at the problem that I raised, which is that you can't use this. Like, first of all, it's dubious to use a kind of implicit contract analysis. So, but, but let's just say we do use it, OK? Um, it's very difficult, I think, to apply that to children for all the reasons that the best interests of the child and all our discussions about children um, bring to the fore here that um, 
we assume that they can be more easily manipulated, that they don't think of the future in quite the same way, that perhaps they might be able to be bribed, that they, that they have less experience of the world. So I just think that argument just breaks down at that, at that level. Just as if I made a contract with a child to buy the child's parents' house, it would break down because they're in no position to make that contract. And that's what makes the videos difficult too. It's, the videos bring us back to this issue as well. Under what conditions, you know, under what conditions was there informed consent there? Normally we, we then rely on bringing some other adult in, like the parent. How are they brought into this kind of situation? That's an interesting question, I think. And when there's money involved, we kind of ask about the power dynamic there too, but that power dynamic seems inherent in the relationship between adults and children and just can't be edited out of the picture. Um, now all the hands are starting to go up, um, but I think I'll listen to Surely in, in a contract, if you create a situation where the parents are the well, I'm saying that I think they're implicit, yeah, and I think that... I don't think that's already... I think they're a bit random, but we will plot that. Okay. The three you picked, I can think of at least six different ones. But if you just take your three, mm. if you're protecting the integrity of the assignments mm. in the sense of court against the parent, and the child is a parcel in, in that negotiation, the importance of home is essentially punity on the parent. You have done the wrong thing. Well, that, well, that's assuming that was the relationship between the parent and the child, but yeah. yeah. But, they said, but I think in terms of the way the state is conceptualizing it, it's far more about a punitive attitude to those parents who bring their children across than anything to do with the child who's able to take the best interest in that very cryptic way, where it's the best interest of those issues of feeling only in the court's best. You are a possible mom and dad that the is um is not great. And I being a civilized mm. Western state with more developed ideas about the right of the child have a better one. Mm. And that's the battle that's being fought back to push the abuse of children by powers, where they come bridge when they try to Well, I don't think that's true, but um it could be. Um, that their real motivation is to punish the parents here. I don't think it's true because I think it goes too far. One, they don't actually say that, so there isn't evidence for it from that. Secondly, I think we don't even need to get to that level. Let's face it, their real motivation is migration control. But they want to operate that migration control within a minimally decent moral framework. So at least that gives us the opportunity to then say, does what they're doing correspond to the minimally decent moral framework? No government official I've heard wants to get up and say, we want to punish the parents here. And there are probably good reasons for that too, because someone's going to go and find out the real circumstances of why people left, and they may have nothing to do, or very little to do, with circumstances that are under the parents' control. So I just... I, I mean, I don't say that that's impossible that that could be a motivation. I've just seen no evidence for it. But there's a terrible point. Would it carry other parents? No, I think that. No, I think that's deterring other children. I suppose it is deterring parents as well, to the extent that, and we don't know. I mean, I mean, Lisa made a very good point that this could be seen as part of a migration strategy in some circumstances. Uh, for the family, you know, you get off to Europe, you earn some money, you help the family in that context. And that's true, but I don't know to what extent that explains all of what's going on here, a large percentage or um, whatever. But clearly the, the kind of deterrence would operate, I agree with you there, if that is the case, then the deterrence would operate on the uh, parents as much as the children, that's right. That's because... Well, well, that's a good point, Lisa, and you made it this morning, and um, I didn't come back to it, and 
you may well be right, and I, and I think you probably are right here, but as you know from watching the history of asylum policies over the last 20 years, those kind of empirical facts don't tend to get in the way of government <laughs> policy making in this realm, right? Because you've made that argument and you could quite rightly make it in many different contexts. Uh, I, we have to end it, I think. But I'm. I'm I've just been suggesting yeah. uh, we have really quite a long way uh, pointing out that uh, the case is not a I have a little bit of time, about 10 minutes. If you have questions, then we can pray for the fact that you are available in the other room. I just have to remove the phone call. Yeah, um, I would just say that even though I don't have PowerPoint, I'd happily send my paper to anyone that wants it to do what they want with it. So if you want to carry on with okay. more important sure. discussion, and then uh, we will be back here at 4 o'clock.